I've been teaching on relationships the past couple of Wednesdays. I've talked specifically on the marriage relationship, and I will continue and hopefully conclude. But I'm wanting to talk, if you see our foundation text, Genesis 2, 24. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife. They shall become one flesh. The one flesh is uh, both physical and metaphorical. Speaking of now they don't have their own separate interests, but they make decisions as one. They form a new family unit with a new identity. And I think this, these lessons are important. Obviously, they're important to those who are married, even those who've been married for years. If you think you have arrived at a state of expertise, well, probably something this week will challenge that expertise. But even if you're single, young, or old, I think it's very important that all of us be on the same page together, hear from the pastor, hear what the word of the Lord is, so that we're in a position for our own lives and also on behalf of our own friends, family, extended family, to speak uh, what is the word of God. So if all of this is well known to you, consider to refresh your course and glean what you can and to let the Lord speak to you. We've talked about the Christian husband. Now we need to talk about the Christian wife. And so we'll pick up where we left off. Now, in uh, going to Ephesians 5, which we've referred to several times before, we see that the wife is supposed to submit to her husband's leadership. Uh, there are several different interpretations of marriage. Uh, the Christian concept, the biblical concept, I think, is the husband is the leader of the home. That does not mean the dictator. I covered this in the lesson on the husband. He has no a right to abuse his family, whether mentally, or verbally, or much less physically. Uh, he doesn't make arbitrary decisions. He's not supposed to make decisions based on his selfish interest, but he makes the decisions what is best for the whole family. And indeed, I think the model for decision-making is husband and wife make decisions jointly. But the husband needs to take the leadership. And as I explain, uh, authority and responsibility go hand in hand. If we put the first responsibility on the husband to provide food, shelter, clothing, and spiritual, a spiritual home, then he must have an equivalent authority to do his job. And all that I'm pointing out here is the wife needs to let the husband do his job. Let him be the leader. Now, she needs to work just as hard as he. It's not a master-slave relationship. It's not a superior-inferior relationship. But it's learning what role that God has designed for us. Uh, someone said the husband is the head, but the wife is the neck that turns the head. There's a lot of truth to that. So uh, it's really, uh, it's not about who gets ahead or who's more important or whose will prevails, but it's finding our proper role and uh contributing to the family unit, to the marriage partnership in our distinctive ways. And so with that said, the wife should honor her husband as the leader, both publicly and privately. And we see this in Ephesians 5, 22 through 24. Again, in a previous lesson, I explained there is a mutual submission that is the context for the relationship. But within that mutual submission, there is definitely a role for the wife to respect and encourage her husband's leadership. We see this in Ephesians 5, 22 through 24. Wives, submit to your own husbands. So it's not a general all women submit to all men. If you're a man, you pull rank over every woman. But it's a husband-wife relationship. Submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church. He is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. And notice, now even if the family is unsaved or even if the husband is unsaved, he should still be the leader. But this is specifically in the context of a Christian marriage so where both parties are seeking and doing God's will. So to the extent that one party is not doing God's will, there's a limitation on how far you go. So if a husband is unsaved, or even if he's supposed to be saved, but he's making decisions contrary to God's will, while the wife should be respectful and careful, she has to draw the line at her own integrity, her own conscience. There is a general principle 
uh, in Acts chapter 5, we ought to obey God rather than men. So even though there's a, a, a general statement that we respect, for example, the authority of our country, if the law of the land forbids uh, Christian ministry or Christian worship, we obey God rather than the authority of the land. And that's even true in the home. There comes a point where the husband doesn't have the right to insist on decisions contrary to uh, the Christian conscience or Christian teaching. But in the ideal situation where husband and wife are both in church and seeking God's will, you would expect the husband to exert spiritual leadership and the wife should respect it. So uh, if the husband says, uh, we're going to go to church on to Sunday school every Sunday, the wife should not undermine that. She shouldn't speak against that in front of the kids or anywhere else, but she should respect his leadership. And that's a positive example of what it would mean to submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Ephesians 5.33 reiterates, Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. So there's a principle of respect in conduct and speech and attitude. Uh, and I'm using the New King James uh, throughout. Colossians 3.18, another witness, wives submit to your own husbands as is fitting in the Lord. And I think there can be a, a dual application as is fitting. It is fitting for the wife to do this, but to the extent that it is fitting. So you don't, if your husband says, we're going to go gambling uh, this weekend, so I want you to come with me to the casino, then that's not fitting in the Lord. Uh, so you submit to your husband as it is proper and fitting in the Lord. Now, let's move along. What is the, the wife's role? She is the keeper of the home. Now, that does not mean she has to stay at home. It doesn't mean she can't work on some secular job or provide income. But what it means, and, and again, I should say it's a partnership. So both should be concerned. I've said the husband, he should be concerned about providing for his family. Well, that doesn't mean the wife should have no concern. She's right in the middle of it. And uh, I'm saying the wife should be the keeper of the home. That doesn't mean the husband shouldn't have any concern. But in the division of labor, so to speak, or in the sharing of responsibility, the wife must keep foremost, uh, make sure to provide a home and more than a shelter to make sure emotionally and spiritually there's a home. And that, I think, is a natural outgrowth of the mother's nurturing role. She's the one that physically bears the children, that physically nurses the children, who's the primary caregiver of the very small children just by the way biology has constructed it. So it's natural that for the infant and the very small child, the mother is seen as the center of the home. So that role is not just something we're imposing arbitrarily. That role is something that's come out of the way God created women and men to be different. And so since she naturally has that advantage or that initial role, that becomes an important uh, outgrowth of her total life that even as the children get older, she is the one that tries to make sure there is a home. And I know uh, this seems for most women to be uh, something that is a natural priority. I know in our home, you know, I try to be uh, mindful of what the family needs. My wife tries to be mindful of what the family needs. But chances are she's going to be the one to remind, well, we need to do something as a family. Or we need to have a Bible study. Or be careful not to be gone too long. Or I'm going to have supper ready at this certain time. So in other words, it's her priority and her responsibility to make sure the home stays a home. And she helps the husband do that. Now, this is a scriptural statement, Titus 2, 4 through 5. And in, this is in the context of the older women should teach the younger women. What? That they admonish the young women to love their husbands. So there is an affirmative statement to love your husbands. It's not just husbands love your wife, but wife love your husband. Uh, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, homemakers or keepers at home. Good, obedient to their own husbands that the word of God may not be blasphemed. Now notice here, she's supposed to love her husband, she's supposed to love her children, and she's supposed to manage the household affairs. We see a good example in Proverbs 31, 
the famous passage about the virtuous woman or the, the woman who's of great value and worth. Notice some of the characteristics of her. In Proverbs 31, 13 through 15, she seeks wool and flax and willingly works with her hands. Now, obviously, this is an ancient society where you can't go down to Walmart or, uh, if you're rich, Neiman Marcus or whatever, uh, but you have to provide. And so notice she is providing clothing for the family. Uh, she is like the merchant ships. She brings her food from afar. So she provides the groceries. So you can see her out shopping at the market. Uh, for food. She also rises while it is yet night and provides food for her household and a portion for her maidservants. Now, this is not looking at a poverty-stricken family, but a family that's well off enough to have maidservants. So here we see the woman is a manager. She manages the household. She manages the, the workers in the home. She manages the food uh, production or the food uh, procurement, I should say. She manages... Uh, to provide for the daily necessities. So she's very involved in making sure the home is functioning properly. Now, this is just an, an ideal picture, a general picture. Each individual is different. Each family unit is a little different. Each marriage is a little different. So in one marriage, the husband may be good at finances or at, at figures, and he, he does the primary uh, work of balancing the checkbook or choosing the investments. Uh, another family may be just the opposite. The wife may be the one that's much better at finances or or arithmetic. So each couple divides things up according to their own desires and their own uh, talents and gifts. But this is an example to show you that a woman will be very concerned and diligent about making sure her home runs smoothly and and her family members are well cared for. Uh, verse 21 and 22, she's not afraid of snow for her household, for all her household is clothed with scarlet. She makes tapestry for herself. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. So when it's cold outside, uh, she doesn't have to be embarrassed because, because her family's well clothed. She's already made provision. So she plans in advance. And more than the minimum, it seems that she uh, is able to put the finer touches upon the family, upon the home. Here we have nice clothing. It's uh, even expensive clothing. Scarlet, fine linen, and purple are examples of rather expensive items in ancient society. So she plans for her family and also the de decorations of her house. And, and this will probably ring true to most men. Again, there are exceptions. Some men may be very good skilled at uh, interior decor, but by and large, it's going to be the woman who thinks of the fine linen and the purple and the tapestry uh, for the, you know, for the family. And the man is probably not going to pay as much attention. So it's just an example. Verse 27, she watches over the ways of her household, does not eat the bread of idleness. So she is not just one who sits around all day and sleeps in, but she's very diligent about providing for the needs of her family. Not only that, she contributes to the family's economic stability. Now, in ancient societies, you didn't really have, you know, going to the office for a job. Uh, most of the work was done within the context of the home. You know, a farmer, he farmed there in the backyard. The, you know, he, they lived on their homestead. Or the craftsman, he worked in the shop, or he worked in the home, or he worked in the barn, or wherever. And so... Family industry was done all localized. So our modern economy of industry and uh, going to a distant office or a diff uh, distant um, uh, place of labor, uh, factory and so on, was, was not quite known then. But the principles of economics were known. And notice the, the wife's role. Verse 16, she considers a field and buys it. From her profits, she plants a vineyard. So here's a picture of a woman. It doesn't say that her husband did all the work. She does business investing. So she goes out, looks around. She finds a field and buys it. And then from her pro profit, she plants a vineyard. So she is a small businesswoman. She's starting her own business or she's buying and selling. It looks like her husband's doing other things, but she has enough astuteness to go out. And here she is investing in property and selling it for a profit. Um, and it doesn't say her husband told her to do it or her husband approved it. I, you know, they're working as a team. But the point is, she has independent judgment, independent ability, uh, even uh, ability and authority to spend money uh, for investment purposes. And then she uh, plants a vineyard. So 
you know, he might be growing various crops to eat. Well, she plants a vineyard, not only for the personal needs of the family, but probably to sell uh, the, the, the grapes and the juice. So here we have a picture of a woman who is very involved in the economics of the family, not just as a maidservant or someone who cleans house, but someone who's involved in business. So I think that does give us the understanding that while a woman should not neglect her own home and family, there's nothing scripturally that would bar her from working on various types of jobs that would provide economic income to the family. Now, I do recommend when children are very small, if at all possible, the mother should be at home with them uh, as much as possible because that's the critical time of development. And typically, uh, the mother is the one who's most able, most suited to be there for them. So that's the ideal. But you can see that a lot of opportunities open up just from this description in Proverbs 31. Verse 18, she perceives that her merchandise is good. Her lamp does not go out by night. So apparently, here's an example of manufacturing in the home. And she stays up late at night, maybe after the others have gone to bed. You know, the husband might be getting up at dawn to go work in the fields, and he crashes at, at dusk while well, she's still working by uh, candlelight or by lamplight making things to sell. So she's doing her part for the economic well-being of the family. They work as a team. They work as a partnership. Verse 24, she makes linen garments and sells them and supplies sashes for the merchants. So again, here's another businesswoman. She's involved in, uh, in, in some types of business, manufacturing, buying, selling. Another role is to help and advise her husband. She's not when it says respect her husband, submit to a husband, it doesn't mean she can't and shouldn't have her own opinion. It doesn't mean she can't or shouldn't express it. But there's a right way and there's a wrong way. But the right way is going back to Genesis 2.18. God said, I will make him a helper comparable to him. So again, we're going back to a partnership. And the, the wife's role is to help. And the way I look at it, and I I consider this in... All of my relationships, if someone, if we're working together, even if I am the leader, I don't see the role of the person that's helping me is just do what I say and be quiet, but I want them to help me. And if I'm doing something wrong, I want them to let me know. If I'm getting ready to make a bad decision or if I've made a mistake, you know, I want them to know, uh, them to, to let me know. And I want the kind of worker who's capable of discerning that. Now, I want them to be very nice to me. And have it tell me in a very nice way. But if I'm, if I've, if I've mistreated someone, I expect my wife to say, well, you know, I, I'm not sure that's the right approach or have you considered this? I, I don't want her to say, you're just a failure. Or, you're stupid. You're dumb. You don't know what you're doing. But I want her to find a nice way to say, you need to revisit that decision. Same way with my, the associate pastor, with the secretary. They need to find a nice way to say, brother Bernard, you made a mistake. Because, uh, the, you know, the, the, the worst thing would be to let me do something that's detrimental to myself or to what I'm doing, whether it's the family, their church, or whatever, uh, and not let me know or not provide some idea. So the wife, she knows the right way to approach matters, but she needs to be a helper who is comparable, every bit as intelligent and capable as her husband, but, and so therefore she helps him in, even in the things that are his primary responsibility and area of authority. Verse, going back to Proverbs 31, verse 12, she does him good, not evil, all the days of her life. Verse 23, her husband has known the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. She makes him look good. Okay? He's known as a leader. Known in the gates, talking about in the city gates, the elders or the leaders of the community would sit in the city gates and they would make decisions. They would take counsel. They would hear problems that people would come to the leaders and so the gates of the city were the place where the leaders would meet the people and so he has the position of leadership but somehow it's connected to his wife so if he had a wife that uh was had a bad reputation in the community it would reflect poorly on him but on the contrary it seems that she has a good reputation so that enhances his reputation and there's even implication i think that she must be giving him good advice and keeping him from stupid mistakes so that he gets credit uh, because uh, of his wisdom when a lot of it is because he's got a good wife. And that's the way it should work. 
she, verse 26, she opens her mouth with wisdom and on her tongue is the law of kindness. And that goes more specifically. And all of us, of course, naturally should aspire to these things. But especially it seems that the woman often has a way because men are, uh, seem to have a pretty strong ego most of the time and can be very abrupt and forthright and forceful, not to say women can't do that at times as well. But men team, uh, tend to you know, rush in like a bull in a china closet. And, and so the woman is often able to speak in a way that gives wisdom and kindness. And so a wise man will listen to his wife, especially when she's trying to temper his decisions. That doesn't mean he has to do everything she says, but there's a valuable component of the wife tempering the husband's decisions and and uh, things he says or is planning to say. And a lot of that's just normal interaction. The husband has to make face some situation. He rehearses with his wife what he's going to say. You know, I'm going to take care of this, and here's what I'm going to tell them, and this is the way it's going to be. And the wife gets a little opportunity to say, well, maybe that's not the best way to say it. Maybe you should consider another way. And part of that's anytime you get advice from a, a, a third party, especially the one that's not so emotionally involved, you can get good advice. So another man or, or a wife can use her husband for that. So it works both ways. But the point is often men are out there facing the public, making the decisions. They need someone who, who who loves them, who's on their side, that they can trust to be on their side and have their best interest at heart, but at the same time can be distant enough to say, wait a minute, I'm looking at this independently. I'm not so sure, sure that's the best way to handle it or the best way to say that. And so all of us need a partner like that to help balance us out. And I'm simply saying frequently the wife serves that role for her husband in a very uh, productive manner. And then... Along with her husband, it's a dual responsibility. The husband should take the leadership. And we look briefly at some verses to that effect. I'll just touch on this because in a later lesson, I will talk a little bit more about parents and children. But definitely the, the mother and the wife has an important role of disciplining and teaching the children. As in Proverbs 6.20, uh, My son, keep your father's command and do not forsake the law of your mother. Colossians 3.20 Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. So the role of the parents is important. Now, I've talked to you a little bit about the role of the husband. I've talked to you a little bit about the role of the wife. I want to go back and underscore that it's meant to be a partnership. It's meant to be a complementary relationship. And the word complementary, I don't mean compliment spell with an I like they compliment one another in the sense that they say the other is doing a good job. But compliment spell with an E in the middle, which is a different word altogether, C-O-M-P-L-E-M-E-N-T. To compliment in that sense means you make up for the other person. You are a good fit where, where you're weak, they're strong. And where they're weak, you're strong. So a complementary relationship is a, a partnership or two equal parts helping each other out. And so everything that I've said, I do believe there is a distinction of roles. The role of the father is different from that of the mother. The role of the husband is different from that of the wife. But they're meant to be equal, working together to accomplish the purpose of the whole family. There's meant to be a harmony. There's meant to be a maturity of interaction, of communication, of fellowship, of decision-making, and, of course, all of it under the umbrella of the Lord. The major decisions of life should be made through prayer and seeking God, and one of the ways you can know that is you can ask God to help both of you feel the same confidence at the same time, and you keep praying until that happens so that you're really both submitting to the leadership of the Lord. Now, having said all that, there is an important component in the physical relationship. Now, in our society, sexuality is pushed so much, but it's divorced from marriage uh, in, in many ways. So that can lead to imbalance in two ways. On the one hand, you've got this unrestrained concept that sex is just for pleasure. It's uh, casual. It doesn't mean anything. And whatever I want it to be, that's okay. And, of course, that's even permeated the church world where the, the concept is whatever you like, whatever's pleasing to you, you know, you shouldn't be deprived. Just go for whatever you want to do. 
physically. And that is pretty much what our society stands for. I mentioned this some months ago. Actually, we're seeing the sad results of that because people are not made for that. Uh, sexuality is not just a casual thing. It's not just a physical pleasure or just it's not merely gratifying a physical desire like if you're hungry or thirsty. It's very Im- involved with emotional and spiritual things. I think I uh, mentioned to you there's a book by uh, a, a, a medical doctor who has worked for universities, but she didn't want to put her name. She calls herself MD Anonymous because she's afraid of the repercussions. But what she says in this book is that in treating uh, young people in college campuses across America in clinics, what she's found is the overwhelming message of society and even of the universities is if you want to have sex, just have it, don't feel guilty, Uh, we'll help you be safe about it. But what she finds, there's a lot of emotional wreckage Not only physical, there's a lot of physical wreckage because you can't just totally protect everything. When you live in a promiscuous society, there are a lot of physical diseases and, and, uh, of course, pregnancies and abortions. And no matter what precautions they take, there's a lot of physical complications. But what she said, the, the hidden thing, everybody treats it as just a physical thing, just pleasure, just protect yourself from the physical dangers, and they don't even pay attention to the fact that it's meant to be part of a very intimate personal committed relationship now she's coming from a secular point of view not a christian point of view but she's saying it's meant to be part of this total relationship when you divorce it from the relationship it causes emotional and even psychological harm she's especially women uh because men tend to be more in in prone to moving on although this does affect men as well but women are absolutely not prone to looking at it as primarily physical and so when they're forced to look at as primary physical, uh, then it ends up causing a lot of emotional damage as they try to go from one person to the next or one night stand to the next, or they have a relationship that is cut off after a week or a month or a year or whatever. And she talks about uh, a lot of mental illness, even a lot of suicide, a lot of emotional anguish. And she says it's because our society is trying to say just treat this as a physical desire or physical need or physical pleasure and don't connect it to relationships. She says you can't do that. It is connected. Of course, from the biblical point of view, we could have said that all along. And it's important for us as the church to, to uh, emphasize that point. So one on one extreme, you have the false idea that... It's just a matter of a physical desire or physical pleasure, physical need. It shouldn't matter uh, whether you're in a committed relationship, much less a marriage. On the other extreme, you can have a reaction against that. Since so much of the message of sexuality in our society is negative, there can be some association. We preach against adultery, we preach against fornication. There can be uh, at some point a feeling somehow that the sexual relationship itself is some, something wrong with it. And that's what actually happened in early church history. Uh, The pagan society was so promiscuous, kind of like what we're seeing in Western culture today, that many of the early Christians reacted against it so much that they reacted totally against the idea of a sexual relationship. And they started saying it's sinful, it's dirty, even if it's required, uh, you know, you know, to propagate the species and most people you know, can't really live a dedicated life. But the highest goal, if you're really going to be holy, you have to be celibate. And that came in the Middle Ages that the really holy people would retreat uh, from sexuality and from relationships. They become monks and nuns, and they're holier than everybody else. And even that the physical desire, and this is official teaching, in uh, this, the medieval church, which bleeds over into today, that the physical desire between husband and wife is sinful. Well, that's another error because God is the one who created man and woman in the beginning. God is the one who set up sexuality for the propagation of the species. God is the one who instituted those desires. So in the right context, namely the lifelong marriage of a man and woman, according to God's plan, it is a good thing. It's not an evil thing. It's not a bad desire. Uh, It has to be channeled appropriately. So the physical desire is neither uh, right nor wrong in and of itself. It's how it's channeled. It can be channeled in a wholesome way 
or in an unwholesome way, in a scriptural way or an unscriptural way. So we've got to avoid the two extremes that sex is always good, it doesn't matter when and how, or that sex is always bad. In the middle of the road is Hebrews 13.4. Marriage is honorable among all. So for everybody, marriage is an honorable thing. We shouldn't have an idea that if you're really holy, you can't be married. That's not a scriptural thing. And there are other scriptures that deal with that as well. But marriage is honorable among all and the bed undefiled. So in the context of marriage, the physical relationship is undefiled. It's a wholesome thing. It's not a dirty thing. It's not a negative thing. It's not a sinful thing. It's not uh, something to be frowned upon or it's not just, well, a concession to the weakness of the flesh, but it's really not a good thing. That's wrong. It's undefiled. It's holy. It's pure. But fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. So those who break the marriage vow, the judgment of God will come. Of course, if that happens then we need to seek God's forgiveness. But the fact that it is wrong is very clearly stated in Scripture, and that's an important distinction to make. So the sexual relationship is sanctified or made holy or made separate by the marriage vow. Outside of marriage, it's sinful. Within marriage, it's sacred and holy. It's God's plan. It's actually the will of God. Outside of marriage, it's sinful. But inside marriage... Uh, and, and let me give you the scripture of that, 1 Corinthians 6, 13. I'll start with the second half of the verse. Now, the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord. So our body was not created for sexual immorality. Uh, the basic drive of the body is not sex. That's a false value imposed by secular society. But for the Lord and the Lord for the body. So our first purpose is to fulfill the design of our creator not to fulfill uh, physical desires that we may perceive, okay? God both raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by His power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot or a prostitute? Certainly not. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her? So there's something very spiritual and personal and, and intimate and emotional about the sexual relationship so that when someone has sexual relationships with a prostitute, they are joining themselves, not only physically. And men often will think, well, it's just a physical thing. It has nothing to do with my emotions. That's not true. It does bind you. And so he's saying, how can you, a child of God, fill with the Holy Spirit? You've been united with Christ. How can you allow yourself to be joined to a prostitute? You're breaking not only your marriage vow, but even if you're single, you're breaking your covenant with God. He is the one who has that close personal spiritual relation with you. And it's not just a physical act. You are tampering with emotional and spiritual things. That's why I didn't fully realize this before I became a pastor. But when I deal with these kind of issues, uh, it's not the same as other kinds of sins. And people that get physically involved, there is a tie, and even though they know it's wrong, even though they don't want to continue, it's emotionally and spiritually very difficult to have a clean break because they have joined themselves to that person. And, and I'm not infallible, and I don't go around discerning spirits necessarily. But over the years, it has become not difficult to find out when two young people have become intimately involved because you see a change in their spirit. You see a change in their emotional relationship. And you counsel them. Sometimes you, you're not sure. You counsel, well, they're, they're dating someone that's very bad for them. They know it's bad. They agree it's bad. But there seems to be a hole. I can almost invariably pinpoint it. You've crossed some lines. And now you're emotionally involved and you're attached. What God meant to be in marriage, you have already crossed the line and involved yourself. So now when you try to extricate yourself... You can hardly do it because in God's plan, you weren't supposed to extricate yourself. You weren't supposed to get this involved until you got married. So when people put the cart before the horse, they get involved in all kinds of situations and you see them involved in relationships that they know that's not good for them or they later discover is not good for them, but they seem stuck. Well, it's because they have become one flesh 
with somebody they weren't supposed to become one flesh with. And you can't just cut it off and say, oh, well, I just, you know, uh, you know, I just like I went to a restaurant, and had a meal. I, I just had a physical relation. Now it's over. I forgot about it. Move on. It doesn't work that way. Now, I'm being rather plain, but I think I have to address the philosophy of our culture. And it's in scripture here. We need to have a serious uh, understanding. Not only are we joined to our spouse, but whether single or married, we are joined to the Lord. And so therefore, when we tamper in this area, if we're married, we're tampering with our own marriage. If we're single, we're tampering with a future marriage. But in both cases, we're tampering with our spiritual relationship with the Lord. And that's why when you, when you breach uh, uh, this and when you go into this sin, it, it drives a wedge between you and the Lord. And it's not just a matter of guilt, but it's a matter of you've driven a wedge in an area that God did not intend to take place. And now it strains your communion with the Lord. So it's very important for us to have a godly values in this area and abstain from sexual sin. And if we have gone in this area, we've got to repent, come humbly to God and ask God to restore that intimate communion. And that is possible, but we can't just take it for granted. It's a serious thing. Now, let's go on the other side. Well, let's continue the passage in 1 Corinthians 6. For the two, he says, shall become one flesh, but he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God and you are not your own? Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God. So that really continues the quote and elaborates on what I just said. It is a spiritual relationship with God that we tamper with when we involve ourselves in sexual sin. Now, uh, let me explain further. In marriage, there is a twofold purpose for sexuality. First one is procreation. And some organizations, they stop right here, but that's not the case. It is, there's a second person purpose, and that is the consummation, the maintenance, and strengthening of the union. Becoming one flesh, as you saw in the previous quotation, involves the physical relationship. One flesh is not just one in purpose, it's one in physical union. So it's not merely procreation, but it's for the total purpose of forging this marriage and making it permanent. Now, if there is a marriage but no consummation, it's not really a marriage. It can be voided in God's sight because the marriage was never finalized, never consummated. But uh, the sexual relationship consummates, maintains, and strengthens the union. It's meant to be for mutual fulfillment and enjoyment in marriage. And so I don't think I need to elaborate a whole lot, but let me just read 1 Corinthians 7, 3 through 5. It's plain if you think it through carefully, and it gives us right instructions. Let the husband render to his wife the affection due her. Now think of this in every dimension, physically, emotionally, spiritually. And likewise also the wife to her husband. The husband, the, the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Now, this is not meant to be that one person can physically control the other person. It's mutual. But it's just saying this is part of the mutual responsibility and privilege of a marriage. So all other things being equal under a normal, healthy, wholesome relationship of two married adults who respect one another, who love God, who are trying to do God's will. Do not deprive one another except with consent for a time that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again so that Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. So in other words, do not deprive one another. And I would also say do not force one another to do anything considered degrading or, or impure. You've got to respect one another's wishes, timing, uh, the emotions, the whole thing in this relationship but the overall one is of mutuality you never use sexuality as a weapon to get your way or as a going on strike so to speak it's not it's got to be handled in mature fashion with mutual respect for one another and in that context it is for mutual joy proverbs 15 15 through 19 uh, and this can apply to more than just the the relationship in marriage but it certainly includes this 
Drink water from your own cistern, running water from your own well. Should your fountains be dispersed abroad, streams of water in the streets, let them be only your own, not for strangers with you. Let your fountain be blessed. Rejoice with the wife, wife of your youth. As a loving deer and a graceful doe, let her breast satisfy you at all times and always be enraptured with her love. So we learn to find satisfaction and love within the context of our marriage partner. And for more information, read the whole book of Song of Solomon and uh, read it in the NIV or other translation and understand what God intends. So you'll see the doctrine that, that sex is just a part of sin and so forth is not according to the word of God. Okay, now, having dealt with all that, I'll just briefly touch on some possible things. If, if you want more information from a Christian perspective, uh, speaking more specifically uh, about uh, you know, how things are done physically and any problems that need to be addressed, the act of marriage by Tim and Beverly LaHaye would be a good starting point. And let me just hasten on because I want to talk about just a few minutes for single adults. Again, we all need to be on the same page as a church. Dating and courtship, Colossians 3, 5. Therefore, put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. All right. First Thessalonians four, three through five. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that is your separation, your holiness, that you should abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. And that's very relevant to our day. And I would even say this, Ephesians five, eleven through twelve, this is very relevant to our society, our media oriented society. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. Now, I've touched on some things in teaching from biblical point of view. I think we have to do that, especially in our day. We have to be frank. When we talk to our young people, our children, we, in an age-appropriate way, we have to be frank. Uh, when I men talk to men, we've got to be frank. And by the way, Periodically, I teach on the sin of pornography and how to warn, ward against that. Uh, we've got a handout. In fact, I think in our men's class, that's one of the things uh, we'll touch on. And that's important component of this whole thing. But having said all that, we don't need to get into a gossip-oriented culture. We don't need to go on the Internet to search for every dirty secret. And one of the things, and this is a long time ago now, one of the things that was so saddening to me about the whole situation with Bill Clinton on both sides, uh, both him and his supporters who defended his actions and the people who attacked him and seemed to bring out all the dirty details. It coarsened our whole society in talking and thinking and accepting things that we didn't really deal with before. And I see that in the media, uh, whether it's daytime or nighttime, whether it's radio, TV, uh, you know, uh, internet, whatever, newspapers, even magazines. It seems like there's this coarsening of all explicit discussion of what people do in their bedroom. That's not right. We don't need to go into all those things, even, even how to, or this is what everybody else does, or here's a survey on everybody else thinks and does, you know, here's the thing. God intends for you to learn and grow and have mutual satisfaction in the context of one man and one woman in a lifelong marriage. Now, in other things you might say, well, if I'm going to be a good carpenter, the more I learn about this, the better I will be. But even being a good carpenter, you can read books all day long, but that does not give you the practical knowledge that you need. And so I think, which is sometimes counterintuitive to some people, but the more you try to study and learn about what everybody else thinks, what everybody else does, what everybody thinks is normal, enjoyable, blah, 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 that does not help you one bit in your marriage because you're not marrying everybody else. You're not marrying the average sinner. You're not marrying the average person that's had sexual experience of all kinds and uh, uh, moral values that are different. You're marrying one person who loves God, who's in the church, who's committed to God. So what you need to do is learn what's right for that person. You need to learn what's right for pleasing that person and vice versa. And so you may be, uh, 
your goal is to become the world's greatest expert in the one person that you will be married to for the rest of your life. And other experience or other learning doesn't help you with that unique relationship. We're not robots. We're not interchangeable uh, pieces of furniture. We're unique human beings. There's no one like us. Of all the 7 billion people on planet Earth, there's no one like you. There's no one like me. There's no one like my wife. And so this superficial knowledge of what sinners are doing doesn't translate into what's right for this unique relationship. Now, I'm not suggesting that we shouldn't educate ourselves. There's a time to get information from the doctor. There's a time to get medical information, practical information, basic information. What I am saying, I don't think we need to go into all this gossip, salacious things of what everybody is doing and thinking and behaving. In fact, when you start talking about perverted things, things contrary to God's Word, contrary to the way God created the human body and so forth, then actually we get into things that are shameful. For it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. So I'll let you think about that for what it's worth. What I'm saying is we've got to draw lines even in our mind, even in our reading, even in our conversation. And I'm not here trying to give you a list of do's and don'ts. I'm just trying to tell you we've got to draw lines within our minds to keep ourselves pure. That's true for married people. It's true for single people. We all face temptations. Half the battle is what comes in your mind. You can win half of whatever battle of temptation, pornography, lust, whatever. You can win half that battle by guarding what comes to you, not by letting everything come to you and then try to sort it out and be victorious over it. I mean, we're, we're a lot, uh, we're a lot weaker than we think. You know, in a moment of rationality, we can say, I can handle it. In the heat of an emotional moment, we don't handle it. So we, when we're rational, we need to make a lot of decisions. I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to talk about this. I'm not going to read about this. I'm not going to watch this. If we make those rational decisions, we will eliminate at least half of our problems. Whereas if we indulge in everything that's out there and then try to keep ourselves pure, we're almost defeated before we start. So the Word of God has given us good advice uh, in this regard. And for, for parents and for people that deal with our teens and so forth and our young adults, you know, I recommend that as teens get interested in the opposite sex, they start with group activities. If they're going to go out, uh, you know, go out to eat, go out to do things, that they do things as a group or at least double dating where it's not just a girl and a guy going out alone together, that generally is not a very wholesome thing, especially for younger ages. And the younger you start, the quicker you want to progress to more serious things. So I recommend that uh, if they're going to start dating, it would uh, begin no earlier than 16, that they have curfews, that they have organized places to go, uh, that they go slow on whatever the current term is of going steady. Now, I don't know all the terms. They change periodically. Uh, my kids say I'm hopelessly out of date. Nobody goes dating anymore. Nobody goes steady. They just are together or whatever the term is. But uh, what I'm saying is we need to try to guide our young people to keep things on a casual basis, a group and friendship and small group and maybe couples, but not progress too far too fast. And uh, what I say this, especially in the physical context, because uh, you quickly cross the line into lust, where the purpose of a single person dating or hanging around or hanging together or going together or whatever it is, whatever they do, is to try to find in the future the kind of person they would like to marry. And to do that, if you jump into physical lust, you don't find the kind of person you're trying to marry. You actually start finding the wrong kind of person. And you don't learn the lessons of communication and personality and so forth that are really vital to learn. So, so I tell our, our youth, don't act in lust. And don't hold hands, hug, kiss in the initial stages of dating. And just think, if you do progress to that, that's as far as you can go until you get married. So if you're doing that on your first, second, third time out, well, I mean, there you go. You've just gone as far as you can go. And, and, of course, what I'm saying is that's not wise because people aren't going to wait. You know, they're not going to fast forward to as far as they can go and then hold off for two years or whatever. If you if you cross some lines initially, you're very likely to cross more lines later on. So what I'm saying is you back off of that and focus on 
the, the friendship, because that's the basis of a good relationship. Communication, enjoyment, having fun in a group, interaction, and you focus on the pleasure that you get from being together socially, friendship, mutual attraction, and you pull back on the physical attraction and gratifying the physical attraction. Because once you start getting into that realm, you start getting very close to a line where the only way you can satisfy that is through marriage. And the way the human makeup is, you're not satisfied to take one step and then stop. There's a certain thing in motion. Of course, this happens with teenagers all the time. They plan to go one or two steps and stop. Well, once you set the wheels in motion, you almost lose control of where you're going to stop. So you have to back off and not set that in motion. Now, this audience may not need to hear all this, but you do need to hear from the pastor my philosophy. So your own kids, your own young people that you're teaching, your friends and so forth, that we can all be on the same page and trying to guide them together. Now, let me bring this all to a summary and hopefully make it relevant to everybody here in the church. Ephesians 5.32, very interesting and curious statement Paul inserts in all this discussion of husbands and wives. This is a great mystery, and everybody says amen to that. If you think you've got marriage all figured out, come talk to me after church. I'll, I'll let you teach next Wednesday night. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. What's very interesting, and it may seem strange for a moment, but what he's saying, marriage is the closest relationship to human beings. As such, it is perhaps the best description or, or the best analogy, it's not perfect, of course, of how we are to relate with Christ. Everything we learn in relationships and communication really helps us in our relationship with God. Now, you think about all the joys and frustrations of married life. If you learn anything about married life, you learn things about how to communicate, how to think from the other person's point of view, not what you mean, but what they mean, not the words that are said, what they mean to you, but what they mean to the other person. You learn to think ahead. You learn to think about the other person more than your own. You think about their needs and wants. Uh, you learn to speak a foreign language, so to speak, um, and so forth. Well, all that helps us in learning how to submit to God and learning how to listen to Him. Learning how to consider what he wants instead of what we want. And then that helps us in the church. It helps us to relate to one another as brothers and sisters in the body. We learn to think of how to communicate with our fellow believer. How to consider them more than ourselves. How to consider their needs more than our needs. And so if we can learn some of these basic lessons, it transfers this, this uh, valuable learning experience. Probably marriage might be the greatest learning experience of your whole life. If you learn the lessons properly, it can help you in every other relationship, including your relationship with God. Now, if you're a single adult, you say, well, where does that leave me? Well, actually, marriage is only imperfect, uh, imperfect relationship, even at the best. But our relationship with God is the, is what becomes the perfect relationship. And so, whether you're single or married, we do need to realize our relationship with God has to come first. And we learn, and of course, a good relationship with God will never be contrary to your, to your marriage, but only enhance your marriage. But we need to understand our communion with God has really got to be our priority. We learn to talk to the Lord. And I can share with my wife practically anything, but there's some times I'm thinking I would not necessarily want to blurt out what I'm thinking even to my wife. But I can blurt them out to God and say, Lord, I'm discouraged or I'm frustrated or I'm set. I don't understand this. I don't like that. I don't think this is fair. Most of that I can tell my wife, but there are a few things I might not want to tell my wife because I wouldn't want to upset her or discourage her or make her feel like she's not doing her part or I don't want to make her feel like I'm a total sinner and a total reprobate. You know, So I, there's some things I wouldn't tell her just that way, but with God I can. And so you realize your ultimate relationship of total uh, unreservedness and total trust and total vulnerability is with God. And we learn that that will strengthen every other relationship that we have, whether single or married. 
we realize all these lessons that I've been trying to teach in the context of marriage apply to our relationship with God only in a perfect and superior way, superlative way. And so I conclude this series on marriage. And if you, your friends have haven't been coming the past few weeks, you can tell them Brother Bernard's finished with the marriage series, so you can come back to church now. Um, but if we can learn how to surrender to God, submit to God, commune with God, trust God, be vulnerable and open toward God, then whatever comes our way, we'll have a strong relationship that will carry us through this life and prepare us for the life to come. So let's stand together. Thank you for your your patience. And sometimes it's more of lectures like it has been. Sometimes we'll have perhaps a little bit of discussion and questions. But I want us to take uh, all of this to the Lord and ask Him to help us in our own spiritual life relation with Him and well as well as in our own marriages. And if there's anybody that wants to come forward in prayer, I'm actually ending a few minutes earlier than I might otherwise. And uh, if you want to come and pray about personal needs or your own relationship with the Lord or with each other, then you're welcome to come to the front as we conclude in prayer right now. Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord, for your word once again. Thank you, Lord, for that close relationship that we can have with you first and foremost. And help us to be completely honest before you, to open our hearts to you, to have communion an intimate, personal interaction and fellowship with you, Lord, that overcomes all barriers of the human heart, that we would be surrendered to you, that we would walk with you, that we would walk by faith, obey your word, and do your will. And even in our marriages, Lord, help us to model our marriages most closely after your word, to do what you want us to do, Lord, to follow your word in all of these things. Lord, help us to build strong marriages, strong families, and a strong church in a society that doesn't value these things anymore. Help us to uphold your word. We ask for your blessings. We need your touch. Everyone here today that's going through trials of life or just needing encouragement and strength, I'd ask you to pour out your spirit. In Jesus' name, we give you thanks. Amen. Please like, comment, and subscribe.